Chapter 4. Jonathan Harker's Journal Continued. I awoke in my own bed. If it be that I had not dreamt, the Count must have carried me here. I tried to satisfy myself on the subject, but could not arrive at any unquestionable result. To be sure, there were certain small evidences, such as that my clothes were folded and laid by in a manner which was not my habit. My watch was still unwound, and I am rigorously accustomed to wind it the last thing before going to bed, and many such details. But these things are, are no proof, for they may have been evidences that my mind was not as usual, and, from some cause or another, I had certainly been much upset. I must watch for proof. Of one thing I am glad. If it was that the Count carried me here and undressed me, he must have been hurried in his task, for my pockets are intact. I am sure that this diary would have been a mystery to him, which he would not have brooked. He would have taken or destroyed it. As I look round this room, although it has been to me so full of fear, it is now a sort of sanctuary, for nothing can be more dreadful than those awful women who were, who are, waiting to suck my blood. 18 May I have been down to look at that room again in daylight, for I must know the truth. When I got to the doorway at the top of the stairs, I found it closed. It had been so forcibly driven against the jam that part of the woodwork was splintered. I could see that the bolt of the lock had not been shot, but the door is fastened from the inside. I fear it was no dream and must act on this surmise. 19 May. I am surely in the toils. Last night the Count asked me in the suavest tones to write three letters, one saying that my work here was nearly done, and that I should start for home within an, within a few days, another saying that I was starting on the next morning from the time of the letter, and the third that I would have left the castle and arrived at Bistritz. I would fain have rebelled, but felt that in the present state of things it would be madness to quarrel openly with the Count whilst I am so absolutely in his power, and to refuse would be to excite his suspicion and to arouse his anger. He knows that I know too much, and that I must not live, lest I be dangerous to him. My only chance is to prolong my opportunities. Something may occur which will give me a chance to escape. I saw in his eyes something of that gathering wrath which was manifest when he hurled that fair woman from him. He explained to me that posts were few and uncertain, and that my writing now would ensure ease of mind to my friends. And he assured me, with so much impressiveness, that would countermined the later letters, which would be held over at Bistritz until due time, in case chance would admit of my prolonging my stay, that I that to oppose him would have been to create a new suspicion. I therefore pretended to fall in with his views, and asked him what dates I should put on the letters. He calculated for a minute, and then said, the first should be June 12, the second June 19, and the third June 29. I know now the span of my life. God help me. 28 May. There is a chance of escape, or at any rate, of being able to send word home. A brand of Zgani has come to the castle and are encamped in the courtyard. These Zgani are gypsies. I have notes of them in my book. They are peculiar to this part of the world, though, though allied to the ordinary gypsies all the world over. There are, hun there are thousands of them in Hungary and Transylvania who are almost outside all law. They attach themselves as a rule to some great noble or boyar, and call themselves by his name. They are fierce and without religion, save superstition, and they only talk their own varieties of the Romani language. I shall write some letters home, and shall try to get them to have them posted. I have already spoken to them through my window to begin acquaintanceship. They took their hats off, and made obeisance, and made and many signs, which, however, I could not understand any more than I could their spoken language. I have written the letters, Minna's is in shorthand, and I simply asked Mr. Hawkins to communicate with her. To her I have explained my situation, but without the horrors which I may only surmise. It would shock and frighten her to death were I to expose my heart to her. Should the letters not carry, then the Count shall not yet know my secret or the extent of my knowledge. I have given the letters. I threw them through the bars of my window with a gold piece and made what signs I could to have them posted. The man who took them pressed them to his heart and bowed and then put them in his cap. I could do no more. 
I stole back to the study and began to read. As the Count did not come in, I have written here. The Count has come. He sat down beside me and said in the smoothest voice as he opened two letters, The Zgani has given me, of which, though I know not whence they come, I shall, of course, take care. See. He must have looked at it. One is from you and to my friend Peter Hawkins. The other, here, he caught sight of the strange symbols as he opened the envelope, and the dark look came, on to, came into his face, and his eyes blazed wickedly. The other is a vile thing, an outrage upon friendship and hospitality. It is not signed well, so it cannot matter to us. And he calmly held letter and envelope in the flame of the lamp till they were consumed. Then he went on. The letter to Hawkins that I shall, of course, send on, since it is yours. Your letters are sacred to me. Your pardon, my friend, that unknowingly I did break the seal. Will you not cover it again? He held out the letter to me, and with a courteous bow, handed me a clean envelope. I could only redirect it and hand it to him in silence. When he went out of the room, I could hear the key turn softly. A minute later, I went over and tried it, and the door was locked. When an hour or two after, the Count came quietly into the room, his, so his coming awakened me, for I had gone to sleep on the sofa. He was very courteous and very cheery in his manner, and seeing that I had been sleeping, he said, So, my friend, are you tired? Get to bed. There is the surest rest. I may not have the pleasure to talk tonight, since there are many labors to me, but you will sleep, I pray. I passed my room and went to bed. And strange to say, slept without dreaming. Despair has its own calms. 31 May. This morning when I woke, I thought I would provide myself with some paper and envelopes from my bag and keep them in my pocket, so that I, may, so that I might write in case I should get an opportunity. But again a surprise, again a shock. Every scrap of paper was gone, and with it all my notes, my memoranda relating to the railways and travel, my letter of credit, in fact... All that might be useful to me were I once outside the castle. I sat and pondered a while, and then some thought occurred to me, and I made search of my portmanteau and in the wardrobe, where I had placed my clothes. The suit in which I had traveled was gone, and also my overcoat and rug. I could find no trace of them anywhere. This looked like a new scheme of villainy. 17 June. This morning, as I was sitting on the edge of my bed, cuddling my brains, I heard, without a crack, I heard without a cracking of whips and pounding and scraping of horses, of horses' feet up the rocky path through beyond the courtyard. With joy, I hurried to the window and saw driving to the yard two great leader wagons, each drawn by eight sturdy horses, and at the end of each pair a Slovak with his white hat, great nail-studded belt, dirty sheepskin, and high boots. They had also their long staves in hand. I ran to the door, intending to descend and try and join them through the main hall, as I thought that way might be open for them. Again a shock. My door was fastened on the outside. Then I ran to the window and cried to them. They looked up at me stupidly and pointed out, but just then the hetman of the Scani came out, and seeing them pointing to my window, said something, at which they laughed. Henceforth no effort of mine, no piteous cry or agonized entreaty, would make them even look at me. They resolutely turned away. The leader wagons contained great square boxes with handles of thick rope. These were evidently emptied by the ease with which the Slovaks handled them, and by their resonance as they were roughly moved. When they were all unloaded and packed in a great heap in one corner of the yard, the Slovaks were given some money by the Scani, and, spitting on it for luck, lazily went each to his horse's head, Shortly afterwards, I heard the cracking of their whips die away in the distance. 24 June, before morning. Last night, the Count left me early, and I locked him, and locked himself into his own room. As soon as I dared, I ran up the winding stair and looked out of the window, which opened south. I thought I would watch for the Count, for there is something going on. The Scani are quartered somewhere in the castle and are doing work of some kind. I know it for now. And then I hear a faraway muffled sound as of mattock and spade, and whatever it is, it must be the end of some ruthless villainy. I had been at the window somewhat less than half an hour when I drew when I saw something come coming out of the count's window. I drew back and watched carefully, 
and saw the whole man emerge. It was a new shock to me to find that he had on the suit of clothes with which I had worn whilst traveling here, and slung over his shoulder the terrible bag which I had seen the women take away. There could be no doubt as to his quest, and in my garb too. That This, then, is the new scheme of evil, that he will allow others to see me as they think, so that he may both leave evidence that I have been seen in the towns or villages posting my letters, and that any wickedness which he may do shall by the local people be attributed to me.